Good morning. Uh, as Trevor said, my name is Ed Ernie, um, and welcome to Resco Products webinar. A little bit about my background. Um, I'm a relatively old timer. Um, I've had four years experience with U.S. Steel in the Mon Valley as a metallurgist and process engineer a long time ago. Spent 16 years with Harbison Walker Refractories in the steel ladle application area. And for the last 20 plus years, I've worked for Resco in the steel ladle area. Uh, currently, I'm the uh, steel ladle applications manager. Some of the items that we're going to cover today um, are ladle brick and monolithic qualities used in ladles. And again, this is going to be more skewed to the LMF type ladles, um, pretty much. 100, 120 tons and above. A um, little bit of background. When I first started with Harbison Walker, there were only seven LMFs in operation in the United States. I quit counting when it got to be about 80. I think pretty much most, if not all, the steel plants utilize it. Um, we'll go over some of the ladle reline practices. We'll touch on some ladle preheat practices, observations of ladles in service, the impact of the ladle operation on ladle refractories, and we'll get into a little bit about the LMF arcing process. Um, I had the advantage several years ago when I started, um, when mills started up, they would bring different suppliers in, and I had the advantage of um, sitting in when UCAR would do their presentation on arcing. And if anyone has a copy of the old UCAR manual, there, I think there's chapters 15, 16, and 17 do a very good job of talking about the arcing process, whether it's an EAF, the same uh, items are applicable to a steel ladle LMF process. Uh, as far as the ladle brick and monolithic qualities, we'll go over the slag line brick qualities, the transition brick qualities, the barrel and sidewall, the bottom, some applications for shotcrete, uh, the role of backfill and the backfill applications, safety linings, and the ladle lip area. As far as slag line brick, uh, right now these are mostly resin bonded magnesite carbon qualities. Uh, the magnesite is fused grain. Carbon contents in the slag line brick typically range from 10% to 15% total carbon content. There are some metal additions in the brick. Um, they are both aluminum and or silicon, and some are even metal free. The purpose of the metals is to help reduce oxidation. Uh, one of the processes we'll talk about is preheat, and it's the primary uh, way ladles are oxidized because they're placed in an environment where you have temperature, a uh, hot moving and oxygen rich environment, and heat. Although these metals don't come free, they do add a cost to the brick. We'll also talk about their resistance to slag, arcing, and the stirring process. And most of these qualities of brick that we use now in ladle furnace slag lines, their origination was the electric furnace slag line. They also have high heat transfer to steel ladle shells and they increase the temperature loss to liquid steel. Because they contain graphite, which has a high heat transfer, these brick do transfer a lot of heat to the safety lining, they transfer a lot of heat to the shell and can cause elevated shell temperatures. The brick shapes typically used are semi-used and mini keys. And if you're looking for typical Resco brands, you go on our website, you're looking under the Max line name or the New Line brand names. The transition area of the ladle, which is located right below the slag line, originally this transition was not an area that was typically in a ladle. We just went straight from the slag line to the barrel. 
the reason we had to add this transition from the slag line to the barrel was the increased use of degassing, the change in slag practices, and the increase in stirring. So it brought some of the wear that we typically saw on the slag line farther down into the ladle. So we had we created this area called the transition. And again, it's mostly resin bonded, mag carbon quality brick. Again, they're mostly fused magnesite. Uh, one of the major differences is the carbon level. It's a little bit lower. It's typically the seven to 10% carbon content range. Again, we have metal additions of aluminum and or silicon and some are metal free. Because they're a little bit lower in carbon content, they are less resistant to slag, arcing, and stirring than the slag line brick. But again, because they do contain graphite, they do transfer uh, heat to the ladle shell and they increase temperature loss of the liquid steel. And just like the slag line, the brick shapes are typically semi-U's and mini keys. Brand names are the same. Typically, they are max line and new line brand names if you look for them on our website. The barrel and the slag line brick, we have typically three classifications. This first one is the resin bonded mag carbon quality. Um, here we can get not only fused, but we can also get some brands that are sintered. Again, the carbon content's a little lower. We can get down to 5%, up to 10%. We still see the metal additions of aluminum and silicon in some metal free brick. These are even less resistant to the arcing, stirring and slag process than the slag line or the transition brick, again, because they're typically lower in carbon content. But they still transfer a significant amount of heat to the ladle shell and increase temperature loss of the liquid steel. Typically in the barrels, we typically use semi-use, although we have seen an increase in uh, mini keys in this area of the ladle. And again, the brand names are the same as uh, the transition and the slag line. They're max line and new line brands. Another classification of barrel brick and sidewall brick is the resin bonded spinel forming quality brick. Uh, these contain both fused alumina and or bauxite. Their carbon content is typically about 5%. They have a metal addition of aluminum, again, to re help reduce oxidation. They are less resistant to the slag, arcing, and stirring process than either the slag line brick or the transition brick. Again, these bricks start to contain significant and a major portion of them is aluminum or alumina, I should say. They transfer less heat to the steel shell and they have a lower temperature loss to the liquid steel. And the reason I keep bringing this up is one of the reasons that the LMF became a significant operating practice in a steel mill is that one of the uh, biggest controlling factors in casting is temperature control. And before the LMF, there was no way to put temperature back into the liquid steel once you tap the heat. What the LMF or the ladle furnace allowed you to do was to provide to the caster on a repetitive basis, a controlled liquid steel temperature. And that would allow the caster to perform at a continuous operation without having to make too much adjustments for temperature. Again, brick shapes in the barrel are typically semi-use. We are seeing an increase in the use of mini keys and for the spinel forming brick, if you go to our website, again, we're looking at the Ladle Max brands. Another classification used in the barrel, sidewall and bottom are dolomite brick. The resin bonded dolomite, there is some use of burned dolomite in these ladles, and that's typically used in just the slag line. Uh, the carbon content is typically 5% on the resin bonded, Burned dolomite do not have any carbon in them. There are no metal additions in dolomite brick. And dolomite brick are typically compatible with silicon killed steel making practices. The previous brands that we talked about are used when customers are aluminum killing 
or that they have a combination of aluminum and silica killing when a majority of their steel is aluminum killed. Dolomite brick like AMG brick or the, the ladle max brick have a lower heat transfer to the ladle shell and a lower temperature loss to the liquid steel than mag carbon brick. Brick shapes used are typically semi-used for the sidewall. Uh, they use straights in the bottom for dolomite and semi-use and mini keys for the slag line, just like mag carbon brick. Dolomite brick typically use a backfill practice. And if you look on our website, you're looking under brand names of RDG, RG6, and KD doll brands for dolomite. As far as bottom brick go, uh, Again, getting jumping back to the aluminum killed practice, the resin bonded spinel forming quality brick are primarily used uh, in a major portion of bottoms. Again, they contain both fused alumina and or bauxite. Just like the sidewall, the carbon content is typically about 5%, may contain metal additions of aluminum metal. In the bottom, we get into significant zoning. We zone for the tap stream impact area. And this is typically where you use a lot of the fused alumina brands. We'll use in the tap stream area. We'll also zone uh, thicker brick in the tap stream area. Bottoms are generally zoned for ladle yield. <coughs> Excuse me. What we're trying to do there is allow liquid steel drainage from the ladle. Originally, ladles are designed just to transport steel from the furnace to the caster. They're not really designed, the steel shells are not really designed to optimize drainage. So we can do that by how we zone the refractories, uh, both in quality and in thickness, to allow the ladle to have optimum drainage of the liquid steel. We also look at zoning areas around the well block and the argon block uh, because these can be areas of significant wear. And in the bottom, straights are the typical shape of preference. And again, we're looking at ladle max brands if you look it up on the website. In dolomite brick, uh, in the bottom quality, again, it's 5% carbon. There are no metal additions in dolomite brick. Uh, they're compatible with the silicon killed steel making practices. They have lower temperature loss than the mag carbon. Straights are the same as far as the preferred shape. Again, you'll use a backfill practice under the bottom brick. And again, the brand names typically used are the same, uh, with the exception of, I probably shouldn't have put the KD brand in there. That's typically the burn brand. We do not typically use burned dolomite in the bottom. They're the first two brands, the RDG and the RG6 brands are used in the bottom. For bottom castable qualities, um, we're seeing an increased use of precast bottoms. Um, they offer speed in terms of reline and ergonomics. You have to realize when a ladle liner is picking up 12 or 15 inch straights, these brick can weigh up around 25 pounds and they're having to pick these brick up off a pallet and install them lower than their their foot level. Uh, that's a significant strain on their back, their arms, their knees. So precast bottoms or even pre-assembled glue bottoms offer an advantage. Uh, we also use precast well and argon blocks. The precast bottoms may have a starter set spiral or two starter set spirals built into their perimeter. So the ladle liners don't have to, to install the starter set spirals. They're zoned for uh, the tap stream impact, just like brick bottoms are. They're zoned for liquid steel drainage. They can be zoned by quality and thickness at the well block and argon block area. Typical qualities for castable, whether they be precast or field cast, would be tabular alumina, spinel containing castables, spinel forming castables, and even cement free castable qualities. If you look on our website, you're looking under cast brand names of Uniform and Unicrete 
brand names for the bottom. And if you're looking at uh, precast blocks, uh, we have had some very good performance with some well blocks and argon blocks that use the brand name of Mighty Ag. For shopcrete applications in steel ladles, um, there is a, a, some significant increases in the ladle lip zone. In the ladle lip zone of a ladle, apologize for that phone call. Uh, the ladle lip zone of a ladle. Um, they also do it for the steel ladle bottom cove. And the cove is the area between the bottom and the sidewall. Uh, that can be an area, if it's not installed properly, can be an area of steel penetration. And there has been an increase in shotcrete applications for the installation of steel ladle safety lines. Uh, the one drawback to the shotcrete applications of the ladle safety lining is these may require dry out because of the water content that's in there before installing the working linings. Ladle backfill materials. Uh, we're seeing an increased use in backfill materials because we're seeing a decrease in the use of mortar applications in the installation of steel ladle working linings. Because a lot of these brick, like the spinel forming brick expand, uh, the dolomite brick expand, um, and the overall uh, use like of mini keys, the requirement for mortar or the ability to not use mortar and get a uh, an installation that is acceptable um, has gained some increase. So there has been an increased use of backfill material. Backfill qualities are typically alumina-based, magnesite-based, or dolomite-based. The characteristic of a backfill material is it centers at low temperature. You want this material to center in the ladle while it's still on preheat. Um, it is a granular material, you, so when you take the ladle off preheat and turn it over to do the slide gates, you want this material to be set and not to flow around between the working lining and the safety lining. The purpose of backfill materials are to reduce steel penetration. They all through the joints. They also help reduce temperature loss of the liquid steel because they do offer some insulating characteristics. They fill the voids behind the working lining brick. Anytime you have a void in a steel ladle lining, that void is a, has the potential for steel penetration. They're also used under bottom brick and precast bottoms. And again, if you go to our website, the typical brands there, you're looking at R70DV and R80DV brands. One of the, let me jump back to backfill. I forgot one. One of the characteristics you want in a backfill is you don't want it to build up on your safety lining. Whether your safety lining is a brick or a monolith, you don't want the backfill to center to that because then it will require the ladle liners to clean it off before they install the new working lining. Ladle safety sidewalls. Uh, typically, we're still on uh, alumina brick installed with full mortar joints. And the reason I put the characteristic of full mortar joints is typically when I see steel penetration of a ladle safety lining and it's got brick in it, it occurs in the mortar joint. And the mortar joint either was not a full mortar joint when it was installed or the mortar was not of significant quality to last longer than the brick and it deteriorates over time and starts to fall out. Usually safety linings, the requirement for them is to last a minimum of a year before they take the ladles out of service and strip out the safety lining so that they get a full uh, metal work inspection. There are some magnesite and magnesite chrome brick used in the slag line zone. This is typically if a customer uses ladle degassing. There are some applications where they use cast alumina and shotcrete sidewalls. And there are some applications where they still use a centered granular backfill material. Uh, this is typically done uh, when they use dolomite brick. Um, although some dolomite customers have progressed to using brick safety linings. 
We're also seeing the increased use of insulation against steel ladle shells to help reduce the heat transfer to the steel shells. Uh, the reason this is important is you can keep the steel shells at a lower temperature. You increase the deformation of them. You decrease the cracks that can occur in them and you extend their operating life. The use of insulation can help reduce some of these ladle shell temperatures that we see by up to 100 degrees. There's also the use, as I mentioned earlier, of backfill between the working and the safety lining. As far as brands and the Illumina brands, if you go on our website, you're looking at the Rescal and Cryol brands for the slag line area and the mag chrome and MGO brick. You're looking at Nucon and Paracon brands. If you're looking at mortars for the safety linings, uh, we have Ladle Lock and Atafos and Atacor brands. Ladle safety bottoms. Uh, typically, uh, you get two types. You either cast them in place or we have had more customers, again, for ergonomics, for time, for speed, go to precast shapes in a ladle safety bottom. These are typically 70 and 80% alumina quality brands. And if you look on our website, you're looking at Unicrete and Uniform brands. Again, these products typically have to look at lasting a year before they are removed for ladle shell inspection. Um, and if you're casting them in place, you want to make sure you use um, some steel anchors in them to keep the material in place and reduce cracking. The ladle lip zone. The purpose of the ladle lip zone is to keep both the safety and working lining in compression to reduce steel penetration. As I mentioned earlier, most of the steel penetration that we see starts in joints in the lining. Uh, one of the most common reasons for the steel penetration to get into the joint is the reduced compression of the joint. Ladle lip zones are cast in place. Uh, these typically require a form to do that. You, some customers have gone to buying precast shapes that are segmented. There might be six, eight, or ten shapes that they bolt on top of the ladle uh, in the lip zone. There is an increased use of shockcrete in this application. You get plastics or rams that can be rammed in here. These are pretty labor intensive. We also have lip arch brick that people are going to when the methods above do not give adequate performance and can bring the and are the reason that ladles sometimes come out of service is not because of the working lining, but can be this lip zone because of the wear that it takes. Uh, lip arch brick are basically what they describe. They are arch brick that are tapered. They are usually installed in a ladle that has a negative taper in the top of it. And what I mean by a negative taper is the, the taper of the ladle gets smaller for about the top 10 inches and that's where these lip arch brick are installed. As far as the castable precast shotcretes and plastics, we're looking at 70 and 80 percent alumina quality material. Lip arch brick are typically mag carbon brick. Again, if you go to our website for castables, you're looking at Unicrete and Uniform brands. Lip arch brick are the new line brands. And if you're looking at uh, plastics for the top of the ladle, you're looking at RefRam or Resco RAM products. Ladle reline practices. A little bit of what we'll talk about is ladle shell inspection. This, and this in shell inspection is not the inspection that's done once a year. This is some shell inspection that can be done by uh, the actual ladle liners. Um, they're very general, taking a look at some critical areas. We'll talk about installing the safety bottoms and sidewall backfill and leveling materials, the working lining sidewall, working lining bottom, installing bottom castables, and installing lip rings. 
again, what we're talking about with a ladle shell inspection, we're talking about this can be done by um, foremen, managers, um, and even the ladle liners themselves. And these are some critical areas that they need to look at. The trunnion and the trunnion area. And here, if the safety lining is still in the ladle, of course, they can't do the inside area of it, but they can look at the outside of the trunnion. Uh, what we're here we're looking at are for are there cracks? Are there cracks in the trunnions, the trunnion sleeves? Have the trunnion sleeves become loose? Are there cracks in the welds around the trunnion area? Look at the slide gate and leveling plate and the argon leveling plate on the inside. Are we seeing gouges in the plate that need ground? Are there cracks that need welded? Uh, are they in acceptable conditions? Also, a general outside view of the ladle shell. Uh, this is generally done, it's most easy to do when the ladle is laid down and you're digging out the working lining. You get a good look at more of the ladle shell than when it's in a reline card, depending on the individual practice of the shop. But here we're talking about looking at the welds of the ladle, all of the welds that you can visually see. Uh, do, are the welds have any cracks in them that they need re-welded? Looking at all the weep holes, if there are weep holes in the ladle, do they have a presence of liquid steel in them that can indicate we have steel behind the working, a safety lining that's still left in the ladle, and we may have to remove portions of the safety lining to inspect this area. And generally look at the overall ladle shell that we can visually see. Are there any observable cracks in the ladle shell that may need addressed by maintenance or even engineering to determine if the ladle shell needs repaired before we can uh, continue to install the working lining materials. As we get installing the safety bottom castable, um, typically these are installed in two methods. They are poured level or they are poured on a slope to help increase yield. And more and more customers are looking at increasing yields in ladle and basically we're talking about when we talk about increased yield is optimized drainage allow for less liquid steel at the end of the cast than you had with a standard practice when you pour the safety bottom you want to minimize the excess water the excess water reduces the strength of the material and as i said this material is typically has to last a year in service and if you have excess water, it's going to extend the preheat time because now you have to get that water out of the castable, especially if you're using ladle degassing, where the ladle may be placed in a ladle degas tank. And if you're pouring the castable, again, you want to make sure you use steel anchors that are welded to the ladle bottom shell. Uh, this minimizes cracking in service and keeps the material in place. If you're using a precast bottom, you want to make sure that you put some leveling material under the precast bottom before you install it. Sidewall backfill and leveling material. Again, it's used both under precast working bottoms and safety bottoms. We use it under the first course of sidewall brick if we're not using mortar. It helps level off that sidewall, first course of sidewall brick and get it flat, which is very important. And as we progress up the sidewall, we want to make sure we de-air or vibrate the backfill material every three courses if it's three inch brick or every two courses for a hundred millimeter brick. Um, this will help increase the density of the backfill and make sure that it centers properly. We also want to make sure that when we install backfill that we get the a uniform thickness between the working lining and safety lining. This will help uh, ensure that we get good tight construction of our working lining brick and also that as we uh, de-air or vibrate uh, we minimize the amount that we have to go back and uh, reapply some material if we get a lot of uh, compression of material and we create a void they may have to go back and reapply some uh, backfill material and uh, de-air it again and vibrate it again to get a full backfill. Working lining installation. Installing the first course, uh, whether it's semi-used, mini keys, starter set, whatever it is, it's critical to get that first course flat. 
if you get any humps in this first course and you don't get them adjusted, it's not going to get any better as you move up the ladle wall and that hump will give you open joints, especially if you're doing a dry installation. If starter sets are installed, you want to make sure you get a smooth, constant taper, again, to minimize any uh, humps we may get, and which would cause open joints farther up the ladle. You want to use a brick mallet every three brick to tighten the brick, and here we're talking about striking the brick both vertically and horizontally to make sure we get tight joints. If we're using backfill, we want to make sure we clean off any excess backfill before installing the next course or even before installing the next brick. You don't want to have backfill in bed joints or in vertical joints that will keep these brick from touching each other. The backfill behind, belongs behind the brick, not in the joints. This is a typical view of what, excuse me, a 24 piece 100 millimeter starter set will look like. There are some small variations of this, but I've had a, a, a lot of requests lately for what does the starter set look like. Typically all the pieces are marked in the starter set. Oftentimes there, there's a diagram on the box or on the pallet of how these go together, uh, but this creates the spiral in the ladle if you're using a spiral. If you're using two spirals, you will require two starter sets. As far as installation of semi-use or mini keys in the sidewall, the top view, this is looking down on the semi-use. The top view is what I would consider to be tight sidewall brick joints. As you can see, there's no opening. If you look at the bottom view, we have an open joint. And if you are looking at this from the bottom perspective, the hot face of the brick actually touch. So if you are in the ladle and you're installing these brick, and this is at the height of your head to you or to, to the ladle liner, it'll look like the bricks brick are tight. But as you can see that there's an open joint. So as this lining wears, that joint will start to open up and you'll start to see open joints as the lining wears. Again, this can come from not using a brick mallet to tighten the joints, installing the brick with an open joint, getting excess backfill or getting excess mortar in the joint. As we install the, the working lining brick, we want to install it up to the edge of the safety bottom castable around the blocks. We want to install it on level backfill material so we get relatively even uh, brick, install with tight vertical joints. We also don't want to allow a gap between the bottom brick and the sidewall for castable or shotcrete or ram. Uh, typically, this gap will be about three to four inches in width. Again, this is a, a view of, on the top view, we call them tight brick bottom joints. The brick don't have to have a perfect hot face. As you can see in that top view, they're all elevated a little brick a little bit if we don't get a perfectly smooth backfill under it. Um, and that's acceptable. We want is tight vertical joints. In the bottom view, you see an open brick joint. As you, if you're looking at the hot face, if you're standing in the ladle, you see brick to brick contact. However, if they installed it uh, and you get that red view or an open joint, as the lining wears, you will start to develop an open joint. That may allow for steel penetration of the lining and early termination of the working lining as it progresses. Uh, typically, what people ask me for is when I look at a ladle in service, what do I look at in the ladle? Um, and this is my general priority. It may differ in different shops depending on where they get specific areas of wear in a ladle. But generally, I look at the slag line first. And where I look at the slag line is I look at the area above the argon plugs or by a lance stir if they use lance stirring. I also look at the area where the electrodes are from the LMF. These are the two primary areas, the stirring and the electrodes, that cause wear in our slag line brick. I also look at the ladle lip zone. 
Uh, if we get significant stirring, we can get slag that can splash up on the ladle lip zone or from the arc, and it will cause increased wear of the ladle lip zone. I then progress down the sidewall of the ladle to the transition brick. Next, I'll move on to the well block or the argon blocks. Look at the barrel brick, look at the bottom brick, look at the impact zone. Again, this may differ uh, depending on um, if one customer has uh, a lot more argon stirring than another customer, they may want to put a priority on the argon plugs and look at the area in the slag line where the argon plugs are located. Degassing also adds uh, a different change in how you may prioritize these areas. If you are degassing, you're using a lot more argon stirring, you have a lot more slag line contact, and you're probably arcing more. So you may have a different priority if you are looking, uh, if you have degas areas. The primary reason for this is you want to look at the entire ladle, and I mean inspect it, don't just look at it. You want to inspect the entire working lining. You want to inspect the entire working lining after every heat, especially as we're adding more and more post treatments, degassing, lance stirring, uh, a pre stirring to the LMF. You can get significant wear in a ladle from one heat to another. We'll talk about the impact of LMF practices on a ladle. And this Typically, what this presentation is, is skewed to, most of the steel customers that I deal with have an, an LMF or a ladle furnace that adds heat to the liquid steel after it's tapped. They also add alloys, do wire feeding. Uh, and again, the primary purpose is to provide a repetitive temperature and chemistry to the caster for each heat, so they have to do very little adjustments at the caster. We'll cover some preheating impacts, some LMF arcing, some argon stirring, some ladle resonance time, and some slag chemistry changes. I'm often asked what I recommend for a ladle preheat schedule. My answer is always the 24 hour line that you see on this chart. Uh, the reason we want 24 hours, again, we've got more customers now that do not use mortar installations, um, that are also using materials that will uh, transfer more heat from the liquid steel. So preheating a ladle minimizes the amount of temperature loss that the lining will steal from the liquid steel when you tap into it. It'll allow for the working lining to expand, will minimize uh, heat that gets transferred from the liquid steel to the lining. Again, this is more important because now we're seeing more linings installed mortar free. We're seeing an increased trend in degassing and degassing will increase penetration of joints. And that's what we're trying to do with this pre is get our joints tight. Again, we recommend anytime a ladle gets uh, it's at ambient temperature and we bring it into service. We want to use the 24 hour preheat. Again, though, steel mills are not a perfect world. I often get calls and say, look, I don't have time for a 24 hour preheat. I've got more ladles than I've got preheaters. Is there a way I can shorten my preheat cycle? But realizing there can be an increase uh, of steel penetration to it. So I will recommend a shorter 12 hour preheat, but again, you're compromising on how much energy you transfer into the working lining and how tight your joints get. Impact of preheating. Again, preheating is a requirement. You have to preheat the ladle to minimize the temperature loss to the liquid steel, but it can get excessive. This data is actually from a real, uh, world experience and that does say days of preheat on the bottom of that chart not hours um, it's not unheard of to have customers put a ladle on a preheater where they've got more ladles than they need um, they line it they just get into a habit of preheating it when they don't really need it may not need it for several days 
As you can see, if you preheat it, you are basically burning out the carbon of the working lining, whether it be the slag line, the barrel, or the bottom. This carbon and carbon bonded brick is what holds the brick together. So excessive preheating will take away ladle performance. I've seen cases where this is even more dramatic with ladle preheating. Um, we now have some preheaters that use oxygen enrichment. This impact can be even more significant. I've seen people lose up to 50% of their ladle performance with excessive preheating. Arcing time. Again, in an LMF, and again, this might be excessive. I believe this customer had ladle uh, a degas practice on all of their heats. As you can see, we lost 25% of our ladle performance when we went from 32 arc minutes to 37 arc minutes. Uh, you can also look at this in terms of kilowatt hours. All of these things that they're putting into a ladle at the LMF, they all are there for a reason in terms of steel quality, but they also have a negative impact on ladle refractories. We have a general rule, whichever good for steel making and steel quality has a negative impact on ladle refractories. So all those practices that are done at the LMF, if you can minimize them, you can increase your ladle performance and decrease your ladle wear rate. These are all the impact individually of LMF practices. Here's one of, again, of argon stirring. Um, we can see that as we increase argon stir. This also is applicable even if we're only talking the difference between 30 and 40 minutes on a ladle. And if you combine all these, if you decrease argon stirring, if you decrease your kilowatt hours, you will can see significant increases in your ladle performance. And this translates to lower ladle costs. It also translates to lower uh, argon costs because you're consuming less argon. In electrode costs uh, or arcing time, you consume less electrodes, you consume less electrical energy. Those all have uh, large impacts on overall cost. General rule of argon stirring, uh, again, gets back to how old I am. Uh, there were some LMFs that did not have a very good or reliable argon flow control. And there was a general one, two, three rule that was started a long time ago back in the 80s. And what it meant is one foot in diameter for stir agitation that you can see in the slag if you're just holding a heat. This is typically relates to about five standard cubic feet of argon flow per minute. You have a two foot area of disturbance in the slag for arc heating. Again, this typically relates to a flow meter of between five and 10 SCFM. And if you're alloying or desulfurizing, you'll get a three foot diameter of stir influence in the slag. And this can be 15 SCFM or higher. I will say one thing, even if you have very good argon flow control, that argon flow is telling you that you have ar a argon flow at the meter. It does not guarantee you that you have argon flow in the ladle. I'm always a proponent of visually verifying that you have argon flow in the ladle, even if the meter tells you you have argon flow make sure that the argon flow is coming through the plug, that you can visually see it in the ladle. If you don't, what you'll do is you'll superheat the top of the ladle and you can cause increased steel penetration of the lining and increased wear of the slag line brick. Again, here we have increased contact time and how we increased our wear rate. Um, and again, that number is six hours and this again was a customer that had uh, a degas practice on every heat on the ladle it's not uncommon when you have an lmf you degas and you have a long casting time you can get resonance times in the ladle of up to six hours typically if you're just tapping you have an lmf and you have a caster 
that average contact time can be maybe only 120 or 180 minutes. But again, any decrease in these variables or a combination of these variables will have an increase in ladle performance. As far as slag chemistry, it's very important to get the MGO levels, and I'll use this as a general rule, as high as you can without having a negative impact on either steel quality or LMF operation. You want to have the MGO high enough. Slags, because they are lime rich, have a requirement for MGO. You're either going to add MGO in the form of low cost MGO units, or the slag will take it from the MGO in late ore refractories, which is a very expensive source of MGO units, but it will take it. So it's better to add it um, in the four, in the source of MGO units. These are typically available from your slag commodity supplier. One of the couple of the negatives to getting MGO too high. If you get MGO too high in your slags, you will reduce the amount of inclusions that your slag can hold. You will reduce the sulfurization. Slags will get generally stiff and hard. You may have a problem uh, with arcing, and you will get slag buildup in a ladle that becomes too thick and can impact um, such things as the argon flow operation through an argon plug. The LMF arcing process. Um, again, one of the advantages I have when I started back in the 80s and the 90s doing this, a lot of new plants that started up would have education uh, classes where different suppliers would come in. I got to sit in on the presentation that was done by the electrode suppliers, uh, which were very good, that explained to operators what the LMF arcing process was. If anyone can ha has the ability to have access to the old UCAR uh, electrode manuals, I think it's chapters 15, 16, and 17 in there, do a very good uh, description of what happens in an EAF during the arcing process. And those chapters are very transferable to what happens in the LMF. I apologize again for this cartoon type sketch, but I can't find one any better and I've used this for several years. Um, but what it shows is what the electrode, which is the black element, um, down in the ladle, striking an arc. The arc is really where the heat is created. It is not created in the steel ladle bath. It is created from the arc. This arc is length is only about two and a half or three inches in length. That creates the heat. What that arc does when it creates heat, it superheats the slag. Remember, once you tap the ladle out of the furnace, the slag becomes colder than the liquid steel. This process makes the slag now hotter than the liquid steel because that's where the arc is. It also superheats where I see you show that purple and blue area. It creates a superheated pool of liquid steel right below the electrode. Well, because these ladles are quite tall, this liquid steel bath can be nine or 10 feet in height. We have to get that superheated pool of steel below the electrodes. We have to stir that down into the rest of the ladle. Those black circles you see are the purpose of having an argon plug. As those bubbles come up in the ladle, when they get near the surface, they expand and get larger. They create a stir flow in the ladle and they stir this superheated pool of liquid steel down into the rest of the ladle. We're now seeing more and more customers using two argon plugs to facilitate stirring of this superheat of liquid steel. And that superheated area can be upwards of 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. The slag temperature can reach 300 degrees above the steel temperature during what I'll call normal arcing processes, where you only have 
maybe 10 to 15 minutes of arcing. If you have heats that have longer arcing times, 30 and 40 minute arcing times, those ladle slags can get much higher than two or 300 degrees Fahrenheit above the liquid steel temperature, and they can cause increased wear on your slag line brick. If you notice in this sketch also that the slag thickness is taller than the arc length, and that is a requirement to keep, they use the term submerged arc, but what it's desired to do is to keep any, what they call arc energy plasma. And that's that area where the arc is. It contains superheated gases, superheated particles of the slag, superheated particles of liquid steel. So that as they get it projected out of that zone, they get projected up towards the water cooled roof. And if that slag thickness decreases or the arc length gets longer, they can get projected out to the ladle sidewall. This can be severe enough at temperatures of 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, where you can wear through the working lining brick in and a safety lining brick in less than one heat and cause steel penetration to the shell or through the liquid shell. Um, Again, this is, again, I'll apologize for the cartoon sketch, but I've not been able to find a better one. Uh, there are typically three electrodes in the, in the ladle, so this takes place in three areas of the ladle. Um, if you have lance stirring, it kind of does the same thing. The reason you do it is to take this superheated pool of liquid steel and move it down into the ladle bath. Uh, which is several feet deep. You don't have this in an electric furnace. The steel bass and electric furnace are only uh, a few feet, feet in depth and do not require stirring, gas stirring, to move the heat through the bath. They also, also have much larger diameters uh, than a steel ladle. All right, we've taken up about 52 minutes of your time. If anyone has any questions, um, I will take them.